With so much already written and so much already said about the Second World War, it's tempting to think that we've got a handle on it. We know all there is to know. But this isn't the case. When German forces rolled across Europe in the late 1930s and early 40s, they occupied vast amounts of territory covering the bulk of the continent. Each country experienced this occupation in its own way. Each country had its own political leanings, its own geopolitical history, its own set of Nazi officials running the show. And the Nazi party viewed these countries differently too. The Dutch and Scandinavians, for example, were viewed very differently from the Slavs and Greeks. So let's try get to the bottom of this. In this video, we're going to be looking at the true thoughts of countries occupied by Nazi Germany during the war. There's a lot to cover here, so let's get started. But before we do, huge thanks to War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made for sponsoring this video. Play for free on PC, Xbox and PlayStation and experience thrilling and dynamic combined arms PvP in the 2000 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships War Thunder offers, which are all incredibly detailed and modelled down to their components, offering players a highly immersive combat experience. The vehicles in War Thunder spent over 100 years of development all the way back to the 1920s. War Thunder offers incredible graphics and detail in 4K resolution, along with authentic sound effects and beautiful music creating an atmosphere to fully immerse yourself in. Best part? You don't need any fancy equipment to pilot, you can just use your controller or your mouse and keyboard. War Thunder also has one of the most dynamic and detailed vehicle damage models in gaming, basically showing players what and where the actual damage to their vehicle is. As someone who enjoys playing War Thunder on the PS5, I love being able to see exactly which component was damaged or which crew member was actually hurt. For a limited time only, new players, as well as those that haven't played for 6 months or more, can claim a large bonus pack which includes multiple premium vehicles, premium account features, an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicles, and so much more. Play War Thunder now for free using our link below. Denmark is an often forgotten victim of the German Blitzkrieg. This is partly because the country fell so swiftly and with relatively little bloodshed. As the first phase of Operation Weserubung, the invasion of Denmark and Norway, kicked into gear on April 9th, 1940, there was sporadic resistance. 26 Danish soldiers lost their lives before the government decided a policy of reluctant appeasement was significantly better than total annihilation. Underground resistance continued throughout the war. Groups of Danish fighters committed acts of sabotage across the country, becoming a thorn in the side of their German occupiers. But perhaps the biggest act of Danish resistance didn't occur until 1943. As rumours of Nazi genocide hardened into irrefutable fact, Danes enacted an audacious plan to get their Jewish citizens out of the country and across the Katga Strait to safety in neutral Sweden. Around 90% of Danish Jews were saved in a remarkable act of defiance. For the most part, the Danish government complied and collaborated with the Nazi government, but there were limits. In 1943, when the Germans insisted that Denmark introduce a death penalty for acts of sabotage, the Danish government flat out refused. As the Germans overplayed their hand, strike action, civil disobedience and even armed resistance from Denmark's remaining military units broke out across the country. The Danish government was dissolved, her military and police forces were disarmed, and the country endured its worst period of repression during the final years of the war. Denmark did not experience the same hardships as other nations under the German yoke. In fact, standards of living for her citizens were among the best in Europe throughout the conflict. Despite this, the actions of 1943, directly disobeying German orders of deportation for Jews and death sentences for saboteurs, demonstrate how most Danes felt about their Nazi occupiers. The invasion of Norway began the day before that of Denmark, but the Scandinavian nation would prove a tougher nut to crack for the advancing Germans. It took Germany more than two months to overrun Norway, and her troops met with stiff resistance from Norwegian troops eager to defend their homeland, and from the British, French and Polish forces desperate to prevent this vital strategic position in the North Atlantic from falling into German hands. Eventually, Norway did fall, at the cost of thousands of Norwegian and allied lives. The country's government and royal family escaped to the United Kingdom, creating something of a domestic political vacuum. Enter one of the most controversial figures in European history, Vidkun Kishling, a man whose name has become synonymous with treachery and capitulation. As head of the Norwegian National Socialist Party, 
Kishling had little support in his home country before the war. Despite this, he was the ideal figurehead for a new Norway under Nazi control, and the Germans were all too happy to let him form a new government. That is, until they saw what he could do, which turned out to be not much at all. Kishling's new government lasted less than a week before it was replaced by a German-appointed commission. However, the poster child for collaboration would get his next shot in 1942 when he was appointed President Minister of the new Nazi collaborationist government. His policies during his term were wildly unpopular with the public and resulted in strikes and riots. The Norwegian's tenure as leader earned him the eternal hatred of his compatriots and a date with the hangman's noose on October 24, 1945. The military resistance to the German invasion, as well as the domestic and political resistance to Kishling's government, show how Norway fought to reject Nazi rule. Although, while this was true for the majority of Norwegians, it wasn't the case for all. Around 15,000 Norwegians, perhaps taken in by the idea of an Aryan master race aligned with their own Viking roots, volunteered for military service in Wehrmacht and SS units, and around 7,000 of these volunteers served on the front lines. It took one week for the Netherlands to fall in the spring of 1940, and the country remained under Nazi occupation until Allied troops arrived five years later. In Hitler's view, the Dutch were fellow Aryans, brothers and sisters of the Germans, and so the Nazi high command hoped the Netherlands could more or less assimilate into a growing empire. This meant life, at least at first, went on largely as normal for most of the population. The crucial word here being most. Over 100,000 Dutch Jews were put to death in the Holocaust, and some estimates suggest that practically all Dutch people of Romani descent were killed. There was considerable resistance, mainly in the form of protecting religious and political freedoms barred by the Nazis, and hiding those at risk of deportation and murder. A strike in 1941 saw at least 100,000 workers down tools in protest of the barbaric killings. But there was also collaboration. Anton Musiet, leader of the National Socialist Movement in the Netherlands, was arrested and put to death after the war. Many of his fellow National Socialists were also arrested, but there were few other convictions. It's estimated that some 25,000 Dutchmen signed up to serve in the German armed forces. The semblance of normality that many Dutch had enjoyed came to a bitter end in the final years of the war. Strike actions were brutally put down by an increasingly nervous occupying force, while a German blockade brought about the hunger winter of 1944 to 1945, during which famine and harsh weather killed up to 22,000 people. It was only after the arrival of Allied troops in May 1945 that the famine lifted. In 1936, still reeling from the damage done by the First World War, King Leopold III declared Belgium's neutrality. As the clouds of a new war gathered over Europe, Leopold III maintained his position of appeasement and placation until he could do so no longer. When Germany invaded in May 1940, he appealed for help, but help did not come. His neighbours were already dealing with invasions of their own. And so, Belgium fought on for 18 days before she, too, succumbed to the German juggernaut. Leopold III is a polarising figure in Belgian history. His motives were sound. After all, Belgium had been shattered by relentless fighting in World War I, and the king had a right to avoid the same thing happening again. But many considered him a coward and a fool. Both Churchill and the French president, Paul Reynaud, held a dim view of the king. Former British PM David Lloyd George didn't hold back, calling his actions a squalid sample of perfidy and poltroonery. The king didn't help himself by meeting with Hitler and appealing for the release of prisoners of war. Hitler pledged to release prisoners from Flanders and Wallonia, but drew the line at freeing Belgium's French-speaking POWs. He also permitted the Flanders parliament to reform, driving a wedge between Flemish and French-speaking Belgians who already endured an uneasy relationship. Economic hardships were felt on both sides of the linguistic divide, and the Nazi occupation proved tough and repressive for a people already struggling to rebuild following the first global conflict. The Belgian civil service, which remained intact throughout the war, resisted as they could, refusing to comply with deportation orders that would send Belgium's Jews to their deaths at camps like Auschwitz. Far-right parties that had emerged in Flanders and Wallonia before the war flourished under the regime, 
an anti-communist sentiment convinced many collaborators to join the Nazi cause. And the collaborators could be just as brutal as the occupiers. In 1944, far-right Rexus paramilitaries massacred 27 civilians at Quassel in reprisal for supposed resistance activities. Belgium's liberation brought an end to the occupation in 1944, but not to the divisions that are still felt in the country to this day. It really comes down to which France we're talking about in this section. There were essentially three Frances during the war. Free France, Vichy France and Occupied France. Free France was stateless until 1942, a government in exile administered in London by Charles de Gaulle. From November 1942, Philippe Petain and his men governed France's liberated territories. By their very nature, the Free French were fully on the side of the resistance. Vichy France was essentially the opposite. Under Petain, Vichy retained the southern zone, roughly 40% of mainland French territory in the southeast, but was nothing more than a client state of Nazi Germany. Petain had been a heroic general lauded for his actions at Verdun in 1916, but as an aging statesman, he presided over a vilified collaborationist government. After the war, he would be sentenced to life in solitary confinement, where he would die in 1951, aged 95. Occupied France was the northern zone, comprising all of northern France and the entirety of its Atlantic coast. Once the war in the Mediterranean began to turn against the Germans, the German military regime took over all of France's mainland, effectively ending the Vichy regime. When we talk about the French resistance and the courageous deeds of groups like the Maquis, we are largely talking about the actions in the northern zone. Here, free French guerrilla units and saboteurs, aided by British Special Operations Executive and American Special Forces, wrought havoc behind German lines as part of a vast network of resistors. Names like Veolette Sawu, Jacques Poirier and Pearl Witherington have passed into legend, but there were many, many others, as many as half a million by some estimates, who made enormous sacrifices for the courts. Of course, this doesn't mean there were no collaborators in occupied France. Some may have felt that collaboration was the only way to survive. Others may have simply tried to maintain a shred of their normal pre-war lives. There were certainly also those who sympathized with the Nazi cause. The French resistance is one of the most famous aspects of the war in Europe, but we shouldn't let the romance of this history get in the way of the truth. When the Germans annexed Czechoslovakia, the nation was split. The Czech lands to the west became a German protectorate, while the Slovak region to the east became a Nazi puppet state, with some territories annexed by Hungary. As a result, the Czechoslovakian experience of the war really depends on which side of the dividing line you found yourself on. For Czechs, Nazi rule can be distilled down to two central figures, Reinhard Heydrich and Emanuel Morovets. Heydrich was only 37 when he was appointed Reichsprotector of Bohemia and Moravia in modern-day Czechia. As a young man, he'd shown himself to be a capable and ruthless adherent to Nazi doctrine, leading the Gestapo, orchestrating the brutal events of Kristallnacht in 1938, providing the pretext for the invasion of Poland in 39, and chairing talks that led to the infamous Final Solution, or the Holocaust. In 1942, aged only 38, he was assassinated by members of the Czech resistance in the village of Lidice. Hedrich's killing demonstrated both the strength and organization of this resistance and the brutality of German countermeasures. In response to the assassination, Lidice was laid to waste and its population exterminated. Emanuel Morovets, on the other hand, was himself a Czech. The former colonel turned politician was Czechia's foremost Nazi collaborator. To some, he was a conflicted man who was not aware of the full extent of the Nazi mass murder of Jews and other marginalized peoples. To most, however, he was simply a traitor, an opportunist who saw his chance to achieve power and glory under Nazi rule. Morovets had his supporters, but these supporters were difficult to find when the Czechs rose up against the Nazis in 1945. Hopeful that a Czech voice would quell the disharmony, the German authorities asked Morovets to broadcast an appeal for calm. On his way to the studio, Morovets's vehicle broke down. In a panic, the collaborator shot himself through the head rather than risk the lynching he felt sure was coming to him. 
It's a little simplistic to focus on the stories of two men in a nation with a wartime population of around 13 million. But these two figures do give us a balanced picture of the Czechoslovakian view on occupation. Some resisted, some collaborated, but after years of brutal treatment, most Czechs were in the former category. Slovakia had its own resistance movement, which rose up successfully in 1944 as Soviet troops arrived on its borders. The Baltic states had enjoyed an uneasy relationship with their neighbors. Annexed by the Soviet Union following the October Revolution, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania had fought their own wars of independence as World War I drew to a close, and they'd been successful. Now, with war once again back on the agenda in Europe, the Soviets were back. In 1940, occupying forces rolled in from the east and the three Baltic states were back under Russian control. But this control would not last. When Germany launched Operation Barbarossa in 1941, they had to cross first Lithuania, then Latvia, then Estonia to reach the Russian heartlands. Even when the operation stalled and the Germans were forced to regroup, the states remained under Nazi occupation. The more Eurocentric Baltic states may have welcomed their new occupiers, at least at first. Konstantin Petz, the Estonian president, had even stated during the Soviet occupation that a conflict between the Germans and Russians would save Estonia. But this welcome was short-lived. The Nazis carried out programs of extermination against undesirables, chiefly Jews. Ghettos sprung up across the region, particularly in Lithuania and Latvia. Around 90% of Lithuania's Jewish population was wiped out. In Latvia, a pre-war Jewish population of 94,000 was reduced to around 5,000. In Estonia, where the Jewish community was far smaller, forced labor and processing camps were established for victims of the Holocaust from other parts of Europe. Nazi occupation in the Baltic states was short, lasting only from 1941 until the return of the Soviets in 1944. It would be almost half a century until the states experienced independence once again after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And the cycle of occupation, annexation and Sovietization has left Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians with a complex view of the two years spent under German rule. The collapse of the Russian Empire at the end of the First World War kick-started a bloody struggle for Ukrainian independence. The Bolshevik forces emerged victorious and once again, Ukraine was dictated to by Moscow, only this time under a different flag. Two decades later, as German divisions poured into Ukraine, the idea of independence was back on the agenda. It took less than three months for the Nazis to completely occupy the Ukrainian SSR, and only a little longer for that dream of independence to die once again. The Nazis began a brutal repression, accompanied by a propaganda campaign aimed at making this repression a little more palatable to Ukrainians. The idea was spread that Ukrainian Jews had been in cahoots with Polish landlords, keeping Slavic Ukrainians in a state of poverty and need while lining their own pockets. This led to waves of nationalist anti-Semitism, which made it easier for the Nazi occupiers to carry out the systemic slaughter of Jews and other non-Aryans. As well as fostering anti-Semitism, the Nazis played the Slavic peoples off against one another. The Poles, the Nazis said, were the enemies of the Ukrainians, and such grim rhetoric culminated in massacres like the ones at Volynia and Eastern Galicia, where Ukrainian insurgent groups murdered up to 100,000 Poles and 340 Czechs. The situation in Ukraine during World War II was highly complex. While some collaborated with the Nazis, viewing these invaders as preferable to Soviet occupiers from the East, many resisted. The majority of Ukrainians fought against Nazism either within the Red Army itself or as part of Soviet organized resistance movements. Other groups were driven by nationalism and a hope for independence. The Ukrainian insurgent army fought both the Germans and the Soviets at various points throughout the war in pursuit of these aims. Tragically, this nationalist sentiment often spilled over into outright atrocity and the murder of Jews continued even after the Germans had retreated. Belarus, at the outbreak of the Second World War, did not exist in the way we know it today. The eastern parts of the region had long been within the borders of the Russian Empire and remained that way after the Soviet Revolution. In the west, areas of modern-day Belarus were administered by Poland. When the Soviets entered West Belarus in 1939, its citizens may, like those in the Baltic states, have felt hopeful that German forces might liberate them. 
This changed, however, following the German invasion of 1941. The Nazi occupation of Belarus was brutal, and the invaders extended their mechanisms of repression and murder across the lands, building the Mali Trostianets extermination facility located outside the capital Minsk and wiping out thousands of villages across the country. Belarusian resistance, orchestrated by the Red Army and by the politicians in Moscow, but carried out on the ground by ferocious and committed partisans, is among the most celebrated of all the European resistance movements. Throughout the war, militant groups carried out attack after attack on German positions and military infrastructure. By the time of the Soviet return in 1944, Belarus had lost around a quarter of its population, and 800,000 Jews, roughly 90% of the Belarusian Jewish community, had been murdered. Following the war, a now unified Belarus remained as a Soviet socialist republic within the USSR. Following the collapse of the Union in 1991, Belarus has not always seen eye to eye with its Russian neighbor on economic matters, but maintains a close cultural and more recently military relationship. The Germans initiated two enormous operations in an effort to subdue Yugoslavian resistance during World War II. The first, Fall Weiss, or Case White, proved inconclusive, but inflicted heavy casualties on the partisans. The second, Fall Schwarz, or Case Black, also proved inconclusive, at least militarily and strategically, but was essentially a failure for the German occupiers. During Case White, Yugoslavian Chetnik groups fought alongside Axis troops. These were staunch anti-communists, not so much aligned with Nazism and fascism as completely opposed to the leftist ideologies of the partisans. But the alliance was an uneasy one. Hitler had no time for the Chetniks, and had Case White been seen through to its planned conclusion, would have turned on them after the partisan nuisance was dealt with. As it turned out, the Chetniks were defeated in battle and then disarmed as Case Black unfolded in May 1943. The partisans, meanwhile, had become far more than just a nuisance. Their guerrilla activities were causing havoc in the occupied Balkan states, and they had to be eliminated. And they very nearly were. At Sutjeska, the partisan forces were pinned down by an encroaching German enemy. Alongside these forces were the partisan high command, as well as a British SAS officer, a field hospital with thousands of wounded troops, and a corps of volunteer nurses. Understanding the gravity of their situation, the partisans fought a desperate battle up the canyon, heading eastwards towards safety. Their commander was wounded, the SAS officer killed, but thousands of partisans broke through enemy lines and lived to fight another day. That commander was Josip Ros Tito, a man who would shape the future of Yugoslavia for decades to come. The Nazis, enraged by the actions at Sudjeska, hunted down the wounded and the nurses who stayed with them and executed all they found. The stories of Nazi brutality in the Balkans, particularly in Serbia, have been etched into history, as have the actions of the partisans who resisted them. But true history is never quite as simple as that, and anti-communist sentiment was enough to drive many Yugoslavians to the Chetnik cause, and by extension, to collaboration. Unlike most of the other countries in this video, Greece was first invaded not by Germany nor the Soviets, but by Italy. In 1940, Italian forces in Albania pushed southwards into Hellenic territory and the Greco-Italian War began. If the Greeks were caught off guard by this, they weren't the only ones. Hitler, too, was surprised by the actions of his Italian enemies and many of Italy's own generals advised against the move. They were right to do so. The Greek armed forces pushed the Italians back and went on an offensive of their own. Mussolini was humiliated. But the jubilation would not last for Greece. They had resisted Italy, but a German-orchestrated Axis invasion would prove too much. From April 1941, Greece was an occupied territory. This occupation proved disastrous. Food shortages and famine devastated the country. In the capital, Athens, alone, some 300,000 people died of starvation. Violence was also meted out by the occupying forces. Resistance fighters, minorities, and dissidents of all kinds were arrested and put to death. Unlike in the Netherlands, the Nazi officials did not view indigenous Greeks as Aryan brothers and sisters, and processes of ethnic cleansing were launched by the occupiers. The occupation lasted for three and a half years and left Greece a broken nation. Two years after liberation, 
The Greek Civil War broke out between right-wing groups and left-wing groups, resulting in more than 150,000 deaths and lasting divisions and political instability in the Mediterranean nation. A right-wing military junta would rule Greece from 1967 to 1974. When Vyacheslav Molotov and Joachim von Ribbentrop drew up their famous pact in August 1939, there was more at stake than simple non-aggression. In secret protocols attached to the pact, the Soviet Prime Minister and the Nazi Foreign Minister outlined spheres of influence in Eastern Europe, regions that would fall under the Russian remit and regions that would be administered by Germany. For Poland, this meant being ripped in two. On September 1st, Germany invaded from the west. 16 days later, the Soviets invaded from the east. The partitioning laid out in the pact was now in effect. Only, Germany wasn't done. In 1941, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was torn up, just like Poland had been, and the entire country fell under German control. While Poland longed for independence from both the Germans and the Soviets, the situation was a little less complex here than it was in places like Ukraine or Estonia. Poles did not look warmly upon the German invaders. They never had a chance to. An estimated 6 million Polish citizens are believed to have lost their lives during the war, most of whom were civilians killed by occupying forces. Collaborationist groups from Lithuania and Ukraine also committed atrocities against the Poles who were massacred in their thousands. Camps like Auschwitz and Treblinka on Polish soil became focal points for the atrocities of the Holocaust and around 3 million Polish Jews were murdered. As the war entered its final years, another spectre of occupation loomed. The Poles did not view the advancing Red Army as liberators and instead tried to take matters into their own hands. The Warsaw Uprising of 1944 was an attempt to liberate the capital from Nazi rule before the Soviets could get their hands on it. They failed. Around 15,000 Polish fighters lost their lives and almost a quarter of a million citizens perished as the city was flattened. The scars of Nazi occupation didn't magically heal when the German troops retreated. As we've seen over the course of this video, German rule turned citizens against one another, rightists against leftists, collaborators against resistors, ethnic and cultural groups against other ethnic and cultural groups. Winston Churchill's famous Iron Curtain speech described a divided Europe, but the divisions ran much deeper than this, tearing countries in two, as well as continents. This video isn't about quantifying suffering. Everyone suffered under occupation. It's about untangling the threads of popular opinion in each of the nations affected, and understanding how this brief but bloody period shaped European history for decades to come, and still shapes it to this day. But what do you think? How did the legacy of Nazi occupation impact the events that followed? The Cold War, the breakup of the Soviet Union, the Balkan conflicts of the 1990s. Let us know in the comments, and as always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new. Massive thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring the video. To experience epic World War II PvP battles in planes, tanks, ships, and much more, be sure to head to the link in my description and take advantage of the large bonus pack War Thunder is offering, including multiple premium vehicles, premium account features, the 3D vehicle decorator, and much, much more.